Today we are reading the last chapter in Guest, and it's our last class. The chapter is titled Art and Media. I used to think this was a terrible last chapter. I wanted something much more powerful than this, maybe because I don't like art so much. Um, but, you know, I just thought, ah, what a weak way to end the book. But many of you, several of you said it was a perfect way to end the book. So uh, I guess we'll just go with that. Great way to end the book. Good job, guest. Uh, one of you wrote that it sort of circled back to the very beginning because art and media are the epitome of culture. So great. Um, I won't fight with you on that. If you think it's good, it's great. All right. So. A lot of you were drawn to um, the idea that occurred on page 437 where a guest describes, you know, the sort of definition of art or what is art. And so, I mean, I think this is kind of classic anthropological stuff in the sense that, um, that anthropology in general was one of the key players to move us from this idea that only elite rich people in Western societies are able to create and understand and appreciate art and the rest of the people are, you know, somehow living in, in some sort of artless world uh, to an idea that art is a characteristic of humanity, a sort of basic fundamental thing that we all share. And so the idea that everyone has art. And I think for, you know, for many of you, as, I, as is clear from the comments, this is resonates with you. If you're in a 200 level anthropology class, you're probably inclined to go down this road. Anyway, you're probably inclined to appreciate the art of other people and the art of you know, art around the world. And, and you know, to just sort of drive home the point to us, a uh, guest tells us about some archaeological excavations in South Africa that, you know, they may have been making paint as many as 100,000 years ago, or you see definitely some sort of cave art or rock art 75,000 years ago in South Africa. And you can, you know, you can remark, well, why did, you know, why does he emphasize that so much? There's a sort of a, a kind of hidden, uh, he, the next, the next page is about the kind of more classic, the, the, those cave art paintings in southwestern France and northeastern uh, around the French, the contemporary French-Spanish border. And in some ways, you know, these have been held up uh, by art historians as, okay, well, this is, you know, these 30 to 30,000, maybe 36, maybe 32, 32,000 year old cave paintings are kind of held up as this first example of human art and people have, have equated it to the bursting on the scene of, uh, of anatomic or not just anatomically modern humans, but uh, actually what, what are called uh, modern humans and, and this idea that somehow they'd become mentally modern as well when they come into France and start painting on the cave walls. And so, you know, going back and, and showing us rock art from 75,000 years ago is a little bit of a, a, you know, is trying again to do that anthropological thing where we say, no, this is not something that just showed up in Europe 30,000 years ago. This is something that has been with us for a much longer time and as much uh, widespread across our species instead of just being limited to, uh, to what are called early modern humans. Somewhat ironically, and this is not, uh, or I don't know, I'm going to be using ironically a couple times in here. I'm never sure if I'm using it correctly, but uh, I guess I would say that in the past few years, people have speculated. They seem to have some decent evidence that some of those uh, some of those early cave paintings that are that are so revered uh, are actually maybe have been made by Neanderthals. Now it's probably a little bit impossible to tell. Uh, some people are, are really into that because they're into Neanderthals. Or again, it's another example of how, you know, we don't want to sort of glorify the, the achievements of early modern humans in southwestern France when in fact we see this much deeper uh, attention to art around the world and maybe even among our, uh, our cousins, our, our Neanderthal cousins who may have been making jewelry and art and, and these kinds of things and even responsible for some of those things that we see in the in the in the galleries and, and museums. So this is a classic sort of anthropological tactic to kind of 
uh, play what we might call a relativizing role or take something that is has been uh, has been appropriated or, or is said to be most realized among elite European or North American audiences and kind of and kind of show how other people around the world and of different social classes uh, are also um, art makers or creators uh, that, that sort of thing. Um, as soon though as we do that, and I mean it's an important move to make, there's still it, it it in some ways opens up a whole other bunch of questions. Um, for one thing, you know, it's it's kind of like what we were talking about in uh, Monday's class on religion. That is to say, to say that everyone has symbolic behavior, to say that everyone has a religion doesn't get at the idea of, well, who has the power to decide or to how is it that certain kinds of symbols become powerful? How is it that certain kinds of beliefs and ideas become widespread? Who has the power to kind of to decide those issues? And to simply say, well, we all have art or we all have symbols or we all have religion doesn't get at some of these essential issues. And so uh, one of the issues that Guest uh, talks about here is how uh, you know, different communities around the world will try to sell things uh, often to, uh, to North American and, and European tourists. And they get kind of boxed into this idea of, well, this, these people produce scarves and these people produce jewelry and these people produce rugs. And that, that then gets commoditized in a way in which it sort of locks people into these ideas of that they are traditional uh, traditional artists, producers, and it can, you know, I mean, it can be a source of livelihood, but it can also be uh, quite stifling. It can kind of lock people into a cultural box uh, as if they are unable to do anything but what it is we are most paying them to do. And so, you know, this is kind of something that emerges in many, uh, in many tourist areas as well as um, kind of wholesale art uh, and the kinds of things that get that get appropriated as art or as as commodities around the world. Uh, another issue here is is how you know the art from certain areas can then be produced in factories or, or by different people entirely and sold. Uh, so the, the intersection of art, power, and capitalism is a is a huge issue. And simply saying, well, everyone has art doesn't really get it what we need to do to analyze that part of things. The other issue which one of you brought up is that, you know, to what extent is art still a part of the kind of markers of being, uh, being an elite or being in a wealthy social class? And it seems to me that, you know, I mean, I, I think it's pretty, pretty true still to this day that being able to say that you appreciate art and especially if you have money to buy it and display it and kind of be able to talk about what you own is a pretty good indicator of where in the social class hierarchy you stand. It's one of those, it's, it's a pretty good marker of, of where someone is going to be in this hierarchy. So even though we might say, well, everyone has art and we might appreciate the art of people who are not at the top of the scale, the people who get to do the appreciating and the collecting and mark themselves off as privileged are, are also using these kinds of ideas to mark themselves off. And I warned you I was going to use ironically, I'm never entirely sure how ironically is, is, is used. It's supposed to be, right? Something that, that, that the people understand that the, uh, the the actors perhaps do not understand. But in some ways, it's the people who have been to sort of wealthy institutions, wealthy colleges, who are the most apt to say, oh, well, you know, this particular form of ethnic art or popular art is real art. And so in, in some ways, it, it's, a, it's this funny uh, thing where the more you, the higher up you go on the social ladder and the more prestige you have in terms of your social class, the more you're able to uh, participate in these worlds in which in, in which you can valorize the art of what once was called primitive art or is or popular art and you can display that and have that in your house. And so you know I, I think this 
this is often the case when you go into in, into the the houses of the very wealthy and they'll have things from all over the world and it's, it's like you know they'll be super super jazzed up on appreciating asian art or african art or uh, you know stuff from papua new guinea but you know i mean it, it makes you wonder like what what sorts of relationships what's really going on here when it's it's actually the, the wealthiest who are able to do this kind of multicultural art thing so it's another again another issue that that the relativizing um the relativizing impulse doesn't necessarily tell us that much about. And then a super interesting passage in here is glad to see somebody pick out on pick this out. Uh, it was about museum exhibits after uh, you know the September 11th, and they were trying to in some ways humanize uh, the Muslim world by showing different artists uh, from that experience. Um, but in the process, they they had a very, uh, their, their selection process of what was shown tended to have an interesting effect in some ways you might say that it backfired in the sense that they, they showed, you know, uh, women, women who were commenting on sort of uh, Islamic art from a, from a Western perspective. And so in some ways people came away from that exhibit uh, basically believing all or having their stereotypes reinforced about the role of women in, in, in Muslim, in Islamic societies. Um, and so, you know, all as Guest says here, or he asks it as a question, uh, does do these art, art exhibits which are meant to kind of show our common humanity actually uh, sort of reinforce these ideas of you know the, on the one side we the civilized versus the, the barbaric and so i mean this is i have to say this, this is something that has happened to me again and again and again in in my anthropology classes where i will assign a book or a text that is meant to kind of show uh the the kind of uh, cross-cultural appreciation for, um, I guess I would say in the last 20 years, especially uh, especially Muslims or especially Islam. And it just completely goes in the other direction. And by the time I'm done, uh, people are like, oh yeah, I can't believe how much, you know, I can't believe how oppressed they are over there. We got to do something about that. Um, so it, it kind of is, is, is a complete failure for me. And so I, I was kind of interested in this as it happened in the art exhibit as well. And so this brings me to kind of what I think is one of the, the main points of, of this class that I think that we've been talking about in some ways all throughout Guest's book. And, you know, Guest styles his book, right, as cultural anthropology, a toolkit for a global age. So this is supposed to give you the tools that you need to do what you need to do out there in the world. And I've been trying to uh, really emphasize how, you know, we, this is not simply a, a class for anthropology majors, but for everyone who wants to use the anthropological tools to better analyze the world and to better appreciate and understand it. And I think that what I'm going to call this the relativizing tool is perhaps our biggest and best hammer that we're always pulling out of the anthropology toolbox. And I dug up an, an, an old, uh, a very old folk saying, which is that if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And for some of you, you may think about this in relationship to how when you were growing up, or maybe you had a little brother uh, or, or a little sister uh, who then discovered a hammer or was found, found a plastic hammer or a real hammer. And then all of a sudden that was all they did. It was just hammering all over the house because it's really fun to swing a hammer. And if that's all you have, everything looks like it needs to be hammered. So this is, again, I, I think it's, it's a tool that we're always pulling out of the anthropological toolkit. And it's basically this, it's, you know, to going from we the civilized have fill in the blank there. So I'll fill it in as art for now to everyone has art. So taking what is once appropriated by let's say, you know, white elite males or, you know, Europeans or North Americans 
uh, and saying, no, wait, everybody has that. So if you step back into our textbook, you can see that we say, oh no, it's not just the Europeans who have culture, everybody has culture. Or it's not just the American uh, political system that is interesting, everyone has political organization. Or it's not just capitalism, economics that makes sense, everyone has their own economic system or it's not just Christianity, uh, everyone has their own religious beliefs or kinship. And so you can kind of keep, keep going on this all in, in an almost endless way, those things that are appropriated by the elite language, right? It's not just the European languages that matter. Everyone has language and every language is worth knowing. So this is a, what I call what we could call the relativizing tool, which is to make us appreciate other societies, other cultures, and to sort of look back at our own and be be critical of it as well. And you know, I think it's it's not it's it can be a very effective tool. I've seen it happen in classes, and you know, the fact that many of you were drawn to this first statement and guessed about what is art leads me to believe that, you know, sometimes indeed students come into class or we go out into life and, and we say, oh, wait, did you know that, uh, that these religious beliefs have a logical explanation and the granary, that's just a simply a different way of expressing uh, a certain logic and a certain longing for explanation. And people are like, wow, yes, that is so cool. Now I understand that witchcraft is not necessarily witchcraft. This is an expression of a different logical system. And it's like, you know, mind blown and everybody's happy and we all hug each other. And, you know, it, it definitely beats out the kind of uh, the sort of what we may call ethnocentrism and racism and the kinds of things that oppress other people. So I'm not, and I don't want to throw this tool away quite yet because it, it has been very good and it still seems to be able to work uh, even in recent days. But I guess I would say it obviously didn't work for wide sections of the U.S. population. That is to say, if you think about the anthropological relativizing message, which we've been preaching since at least 1934 and maybe probably before then, but I'm dating 1934 as the, the year that uh, Patterns of Culture by Ruth Benedict came out and became a bestseller. Um, this is something that we've been we've been hammering hammering home for a long time, and still we can say that vast sectors of U.S. society didn't seem to get the message. And by that, I don't just mean those people who went who didn't go to college or didn't take an anthropology class. Um, it doesn't seem to work even for those who are Ivy League graduates. And if we look at sort of the, the degrees held by the members of the, of the current U.S. presidential administration, um, they seem to be very good at either cynically using, uh, trying to sort of not appreciate other cultures, let's say, or perhaps they, did, they honestly really don't believe whatever they may have been taught at those fancy schmancy schools that they went to. And so, you know, I mean, I think that, that if we look around American society in the year 2020, the relativizing message, I mean, maybe we just have to hammer it harder, but in some ways it doesn't seem to have registered uh, among large swaths of the population and among, you know, people who, who probably got it the most or should have gotten it the most when they went to, uh, when they went to college. And as we saw in the, in the last slide about the museum exhibit, it, it can backfire in strange ways. And sometimes we don't even know when it's going to backfire, but you have to be prepared for that. Um, it can, you try to show somebody something that, that seems to you like it's a relativizing exhibit or a, there's no other way to interpret it as then to recognize the humanity of the people who are involved and it completely gets taken the other way. So, you know, I mean, I think, like I said, this has been something that we've been kind of going over again in different ways in this class. If you remember back to the class on culture and how we talked about 
the importance of culture as a concept, but when we talk about American gun culture, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, wait a second, that makes it sound traditional and good in a way that we may not want to, uh, we, we may not want to do out there in the world. Now, Gus ends his book with his, his thinking like an anthropologist section, uh, which I, I'm going to say onward to our final projects because thinking like an anthropologist can give you about the world of art, can give you a more complete set of tools for comprehending this complex part of human culture, understanding your own creativity, that's what I want you to do, and engaging the world around you. So that's the hope, right? We Thinking about the world of art gives us a more complete set of tools for comprehending this. And, uh, before, before before you tune out on me though, I just have a couple more things to say, which is, wait a second though, this chapter is titled Art and Media. And it took a while before anyone actually commented on the media part of this, uh, maybe in part because media is really toward the end of the chapter and is sort of subdued in relationship to how much guest talks about art. And maybe that's fine. I guess uh, for me, I would like a lot more about media in this chapter. I would actually like this chapter to be more about media and, and the things that, and I don't know if I wanna say less about art, but I want to know what is going on out there and what, how, uh, how creative expression is being used in the media. So uh, guest asks here on page 451, how do art and media intersect? Interestingly, at least as far as I can tell, I haven't, I, I had, I, he never actually asks the same question about media that he asks about art, which is, you know, well, what, what is media? Is all art media? And where, where does it come in? Is it only popular media? Where does media begin and end here? So he uses words like global media scape. He defines uh, media worlds and social media, as well as indigenous media. But uh, he actually, at least again, as far as I can find, there's not a kind of, well, what is media and, and how does it I mean, there is this, how, how do art and media intersect? But, but that is sort of submerged, I think, a little bit into these other ideas about you know, the global media scape, which are super important. I just want to hear, I want to hear a little bit more about them and not just assume that we know exactly what media is. And I was thinking about this because, you know, I, um, I in the, uh, in the last few months, I've probably spent more time on Facebook than I should, and and I, uh, you know, I see you see a lot of memes out there. You see a lot of kind of, you know, it, it's it has it has been a little bit scary, I would say, to see the worlds in which the media worlds in which people are in, and how people on uh, on one side of the political spectrum are living in an almost entirely different media world. Uh, than those on the on another side of the political spectrum, and so I pose this as a kind of question because one of you said that well the you know we we can now learn about other cultures because of the global media scape, and we can learn about other societies in a ways that we couldn't before. And I, I I'm sure that is true, uh, but it also seems to at least to my opinion. Uh, be an almost in, impenetrable world in which we can't do the same kinds of things in terms of convey complexity and truth in the ways that we may have been used to. So let me give you an example of both of these memes I actually saw on Facebook during the Amy Coney Barrett uh, confirmation hearings. Uh, so this is Amy Coney Barrett at the top. Uh, and uh, Ilhan Omar, the representative, uh, U.S. House representative from uh, Minnesota at the bottom. And so this is something that appeared on what you might call the more, the, the more conservative side of my Facebook feed, which is, you know, the idea that, that, that the liberals uh, don't question Ilhan Omar's religion, but that the liberals are attacking Amy Coney Barrett for her Catholicism. And so there was this whole kind of 
in retrospect, strange idea uh, that that they were during the hearings that the Democrats were all going to attack uh, Amy Coney Barrett's Catholicism, that they found it problematic to have another Catholic on the Supreme Court. Uh, funny because uh, Joe Biden is a Catholic, but you know, we'll just, uh, it, and, it, and it never actually happened, but that was the idea that in some ways uh, the liberals were making uh, Amy Coney Barrett's religion into a problem, but we're never questioning uh, the religion of, of Ilhan Omar. But then not too long later, I saw on my sort of the liberal side of my Facebook feed, the exact same images and the exact same words, but geared toward a different audience. So in this real, in this meme, what they're saying, I think they're saying is, well, you know, the conservatives are attacking uh, Ilhan Omar's religion all the time, but they never actually reflect on, you know, Amy Coney Barrett's religion. And so this is, you know, this is a problem or this, this is a hypocrisy or this is something. And so, you know, again, you can see here, we have this, you know, the same pictures, the same words, simply inverted frame, and one of them shows up on the conservative side, and one of them shows up on the liberal side, and everybody goes away sort of, I think, believing that the other side thinks uh, in a, a certain way. And and I don't know what to do about this, in part because it's it's difficult here to then insert objective reality. Um, you know, so the objective reality is that, in fact, no one made an issue of, at least in the confirmation hearings, and certainly not in anything that I saw on, on the liberal side, no one made an issue of Amy Coney Barrett's Catholicism. I will admit that there were a few people who were a little bit uh, disturbed by her membership in something that looked kind of like a, a, a sect of either Catholicism or something that was pretty weird looking, but it wasn't her religion. It was, you know, her membership in a, in a society or a sect. Uh, and so, and so objectively, she was, she was never actually uh, attacked in, in, any, in any way because of her religion. But it's, you know, when you're, when you're circulating this meme, the idea is, oh yeah, that's, you know, that's what they really think. So it's hard to, it's hard to get into the objective truth. And then it's also hard to get into the other objective truth is that we saw, we have seen time after time after time, uh, attacks on, on Islam and Ilhan Omar for being, you know, from being, being a refugee. We've seen her attacked as not American. Um, you know, and so, but no one, no one, had, no one had lobbed similar attacks at Amy Coney Barrett to say that she wasn't American or, or was, you know, some somehow way out of the, the way out of what what could be considered the the American mainstream. So how do you break through these kinds of competing memes with a reality uh, that doesn't? that doesn't simply enforce uh, either one side or the other. And then, I mean, I guess related to that, if, if all we need to do is sort of invert the meme or turn it upside down, and then one side is going to believe it, how do you then introduce what we want to talk about, which is, you know, the complexity of religious experience, the kinds of things that we talked about in the last class, the relationship between power and politics, uh, the relationship between power, politics, gender, and religion here. Uh, you know, I mean, how do we introduce complexity into this situation, into the meme world? And, you know, I, I'm not sure how how we break through some of those issues uh, in this kind of global media scape in which in which memification seems to be predominant. So that said, I don't want to I don't want to end this class on on a downer here. So I'm going to then say I'm going to go back to my onward part, except uh, except at the the second, the second to last sentence, the penultimate sentence from the chapter, which I think is maybe even better than the last sentence, which is that after reading this chapter, we might say after taking this class, you should be able to apply these questions, situations to which you encounter art and media, there it is, art and media, and the intersections of real life, although I'll just say that art and media are part of real life, but the intersections of real life, play, 
politics and creative expression. So, um, you know, that's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping you'll be able to do is apply the toolkit, the expanded toolkit from anthropology into uh, real life, wherever that may be, play, politics, and creative expression.